Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, from uh, around the country and as far as uh, Europe and, uh, and Israel. Happy to have you all with us. Uh, great joy to be sharing some uh, insights with people who I think uh, are in need of some, uh, some sanity as we share with you the wisdom of the data. And I want to just stress that this is not a presentation where we're going to be talking about expectations or predictions or forecasts. In fact, we don't live in that world at all. What we're going to try to do is to reveal to you what the data tells us. You know, at the end of the day, we're a bunch of data crunchers. On this presentation, you're going to hear from people who are all CPAs or CFAs or both. And uh, that is our orientation. With that in mind, um, I wanted to start off by just giving a little backdrop to the presentation you're going to be hearing. Um, you're going to be hearing about um, the uh, the past, the recent past, where everybody became either a day trader or a Robin Hood buyer, or was buying memes or crypto or some other outrageously overvalued uh, asset without any sense of what makes uh, economic sense and what is a prudent investment. Um, and I'm sure you know people who've done that. They will presumably be giving up their day trading op occupation quite soon. And uh, every five to 10 years, we have another group of uh, novices who does that. Um, the famous saying by, uh, by Joe Kennedy, I think speaks to this point exactly, uh, when they asked him how he knew how, to, um, how it was time to uh, sell his stock, which apparently he sold out right at the beginning, right at the top of the uh, bull market and, uh, and right before the bear market began, they said to him, how did you know, Mr. Kennedy, to sell your stock? And he said, when the shoe shine boys they started giving me stock tips, I knew it was time to get out. Um, and I think all of us know shoe shine boys or their equivalent, uh, people who have no real background or knowledge who became so-called experts in the field. Uh, their day is done. And I think the uh, market will regroup and move on and leave them in the in the dust as, as they should be. Um, I think many of you know about crypto, and I think you know our view, which mirrors entirely the view of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, there is a way to value assets called the greater fool theory. That is the basis on which crypto is valued. I'll pay X because I'm a fool, but I'm confident that a greater fool will come along who will pay even more. That's not the way uh, business people value assets, and it's certainly not the way we decide on investments to make. So uh, as we move through uh, to see what sanity and the numbers and the data provides, I want to we will be focusing on, and I want to just point out now what we're going to be seeing. We're going to be seeing the following. The U.S. economy is in extraordinarily strong shape. Corporate America is under leveraged, very profitable, investing a huge amount in capital expenditure, which not only is a reflection of the confidence of the people who are making those decisions, but it also becomes, in a way, a self-fulfilling prophecy because companies that spend wisely on CapEx secure a growing future. Capital expenditure, particularly appropriate and technology-oriented capital expenditure, is not only a reflection of their confidence and the fact that they have the cash and are deploying it productively, but in turn, it does produce greater profits, and all the data will, that you will see will, will reflect that. Uh, more important even than the corporate America's strength, um, we also see the strength of the consumer. And you will see that the American consumer has rebuilt their balance sheets after the um, December, after the 2008 collapse. They are strong, and uh, Jesse will take you through that shortly. But um, so um, corporate America is strong. Consumers are strong. They have strong balance sheets. Um, they are under leveraged. They have one of the lowest levels of debt service cost in recent memory, and they're doing well. And given that we're a 70% consumer-driven economy, we need to keep one eye always on the financial health of the consumer. You will also see that recessions don't necessarily accompany bull markets. Many bull markets have taken place at the beginning of, during, and after a recession. And because we're not investing in, quote unquote, the economy, but we're actually investing in a very select group of companies and in a dynamic and rotating way, we're always focused on the winners at that point. And there are always companies that are doing well. And our focus is how do we invest in those companies in a dynamic way and drop them when they cease to be companies that perform in a superior way. And so we think of, of our portfolio uh, almost as a Darwinian best of breed, because as you will see, we're constantly sifting and sorting to ensure that our portfolios include the best 
and the most uh, and the most uh, productive and responsive to the uh, to the environment at that time. As someone who comes from South Africa and has been on safaris multiple times, one of the things I will just give you as a as a visual is that when you see herds of animals um, basically crossing the plains of Africa, you know that the animals at the front of that pack are genetically perfect specimens. And as you move towards the back of the pack, uh, you see what we used to call in the army the sick, lame, and lazy. And those animals are the meal for the predator following them. That's exactly how corporate America works. There are companies that are at the front of the pack, and we want to overweight in those. And then there are companies that are drifting to the back and are almost all the way in the line of the predator's meal desires. And we want to have a dynamic and do have a dynamic manner of making sure that we overweight to the companies at the front of the pack. And as they begin to drift towards the back, they kind of drift out of our portfolio also. And so we have this Darwinian approach. Um, back to uh, the, the data and the, the big picture. Essentially, where we are, folks, is we're back to January of 2021, more or less. We've given up about 18 months of growth. For someone who was, you know, on the moon for the last 18 months, and they just landed uh, this morning, and they came to meet with us and we said, you know, your portfolio is roughly where it was when you left. They'd be very happy. The problem is many of us either didn't get in a year ago and therefore were in for a, a big part of the downturn. And others who uh, believed that when the portfolio appreciated that that was quite a way their money that they're now giving back. And of course, both of those are unfortunate for those people who view things uh, that way. Um, so um, just in terms of uh, the, the macro of the economy and why we're optimistic that we will have a recovery uh, and we're not afraid of a slight slowdown between now and then, the fundamentals are intact. I already told you about the CapEx expenditure. I want to mention a couple of others. Corporations are engaging in massive stock buybacks. When companies buy back their own stock, that's a powerful sign to us that they believe it to be a good value. And also, uh, the management companies are buying back stock of the companies themselves. In other words, it's called technically insider trading, but done the legitimate way, not the secret way, with full disclosure and full compliance. But the beauty for us, as people who look at the data, is we watch to see the, the amount of shares being bought back by insiders, people who know the most about the company. When they are buying back their own stock in large quantity, that's a very good sign to us that the company is healthy and that their expectations are that over time, the uh, company stock will reflect uh, economic strength. The big tailwind that's pushing everything forward and is generating much of the economic excitement that I think is, uh, is there for those who look at the reality uh, is the huge tailwind of the digital revolution. We are living through a revolution that in our time has the impact somewhat akin to what the electricity revolution had on the world 100 years ago. Basically, the digitization is affecting every aspect of business and our personal lives, resulting in massive efficiencies, profitability for the companies, enhanced use of data. Think about the fact that over the last uh, 10 years, we built the last, largest hotel chain in the world without laying a brick. We built the largest taxi fleet in the world without buying a car where our airplanes are full because of the just-in-time manufacturing technology and the yield man management and optimization that allows the assets of society as a whole, the assets of society as a whole, to be used more productively, more efficiently. Therefore, we need less assets. And that's one of the reasons why interest rates will ultimately tend to come down. They need to work through the cycle, and it's not going to be quick, but as you will see later on in this presentation, inflation is expected to come down. And with it, of course, interest rates typically come down as well. We can already see what's called the inverted yield curve, where short-term treasury interest rates are higher than long-term. What the market is telling us is they expect that over time rates will come down. And that will mirror inflation coming down. And that's because ultimately what we're going through now will get resolved one way or the other. And the economy will resume its upward trend over time, the stock market will resume its upward trend over time, and all will be well for those who understand that although the market does well over time, it doesn't do well all the time. Coming to terms with that is really one of the core attributes that savvy investors have to acquire so that they're able to watch market movements with what uh, Charlie Munger calls equanimity. 
which basically means feel nothing. Don't react when the market goes up in a positive way. Don't react when it goes down in a negative way, because all of those emotions are likely to read to lead you to do precisely the wrong thing, and you are likely to act out those emotions. That's why most people buy at the top when everyone else is, and they're most excited, and they sell at the bottom when everyone else is panicking, and they can't stand the pain, and then they're figuring out why Warren Buffett's rich, and they aren't. So with that, I will pass the baton um, to the next uh, presenter. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I urge you to pay attention to what you're seeing over here. And for those of you who need a replay, we'll be happy to give it to you. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Jesse Pachanko to you. He is a key part of our uh, of our uh, team of analysts. He has a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. For those of you who don't know exactly what that is, think of it as a kind of a PhD in finance. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's solidly part of the team, one of our pillars. Jesse, we're delighted to introduce you. Many people have not yet met you. But uh, they'll be hearing more from Jesse. He's a rising star at RVW. We're thrilled to have you as a core part of the team. With that, I hand it to you, Jesse. Thank you. All right. So when we look at the economy, everyone has been rightfully scared of the headline inflation numbers, nearing 8.6%. When we look at the detail, though, we clearly see the influence of the war in Ukraine and supply chain disruptions. Obviously, with the cost of oil going up, energy prices are being paid by individuals, but it's something that can be resolved. At the same time, if you look at the cost of new cars, it's getting smaller, the increase is getting smaller and smaller. So as we get through the war, there is some resolution that we can expect, and we do expect inflation to moderate. The market itself tells us what inflation is likely to be. The U.S. government issues both regular Treasury bonds, but also inflation-adjusted Treasury bonds, and a difference in yield between the two tells you what the market expects inflation to be. When comparing the yields on two 10-year bonds, we see that the market expects an inflation rate of 2.6% over the next 10 years. While that is much higher than a 2% trend pre-pandemic, it is much lower and much less disorienting than 8%. Likewise, the five-year inflation rate is expected to be just 2.8%. These are manageable inflation rates that companies can adjust for. So when looking at the economy, what we do see is a robust job market and healthy household balance sheets. Given that consumption makes up 70% of US GDP, we are optimistic that the post-pandemic rebound will endure. Since the pandemic weakness, the U.S. unemployment rate has fallen back to very low levels. In addition, the number of job openings is quite high. So while inflation, in, while higher in interest rates may depress some economic sectors, there are plenty of companies aggressively trying to expand. Meanwhile, households uh, have come out of the pandemic with excess savings and lower costs. Though many workers suffered initially during the pandemic, Government transfers more than offset their lost earnings. At the same time, there was a delay in spending. The combined effect have had led to a savings cushion worth about $1.8 trillion that will help consumer spending endure. Similarly, during the pandemic, many households refinance their mortgage at extremely low rates and have locked in savings for many years to come. Debt payments as a percentage of disposable income has fallen to about 10% uh, from uh, fallen from 10% to 9.3%. Although a modest fall percentage-wise, disposable income is $18 trillion. So this boosts household annual spending ability by $126 billion. When we look at aggregate household balance sheets, we see vast improvements from the end of the great financial crisis. Back in 2006, household total assets were $85 trillion. Now, total assets are $163 trillion. Meanwhile, debts are small in comparison. When we look at high frequency data, we are not surprised to see the economy reapproaching pre pandemic normal. Restaurant reservations are 6% higher than 2019. Hotel occupancy is just 4% lower than the same period in 2019. TSA checkpoint data is just 12% lower than 2019. So the economy is approaching a new normal that we can expect to endure over the long term. Many economists forecast a 2% growth rate for 2022, and we agree with that assessment, which makes us optimistic on the markets as well.
Okay. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, I'm going to thank you very much, Jesse. Let me carry on with some of the discussion on uh, macroeconomic um, observations with, with the data before us. Uh, here, what you see is the real GDP trend. And you can see the red tail end in, at the end there is the forecast Q4. Uh, generally trending very positively with a full recovery from the uh, COVID collapse that we saw in 19 and 20, right back on track. In fact, if you took a ruler and, had, and drew a line across that, it would almost be a straight line barring the dip, um, which is just great, great to support a lot of the data that Jesse had previously shown us. And what we're trying to do as advisors is counter the emotion that investors tend to bring to the table. And this is the emotional chart of buying and selling relative to the euphoria and panic that most investors experience. And you can see that uh, unlike uh, retail shopping, when, when there's a discount, we're all flooding to the stores. On Wall Street or in the markets, when things are on sale, we all fear and run. And when they're fully priced retail, we're all piling in. And what we try to do as advisors, as counselors, uh, as portfolio builders, um, is eliminate the emotion in the portfolio design and stick to the plan. And uh, if you stick to the plan, you're doing very, very well. This slide here is a fantastic retrospective of uh, the performance of the S&P 500 uh, relative to each of the bear markets since 1948. And you'll see that the first column there is six months be leading into the recession. Then you've got the during the recession, and then you've got the one, three, five, and 10 year look back. And I've particularly highlighted the three and five year after recession columns. And you'll see that three years after recession and five years after recession, every single row in those columns is green and strongly green. And so what we're seeing is, is that the economy through the capitalist system of great businesses and innovative managers figure it out. They figure out what the consumers need, and it might be different than before the recession, what the supply chain looks like and what products they're developing and to whom they're selling it. And the overall economy's strength does rebound, or it certainly has, every single recession going back to 1948 as measured by the S&P 500. And it's just great data to look at. And we can look at that very similar data in a slightly different way. Uh, rather than looking at recessions, we're going to look at market collapses. And you'll see there that the first grouping of pillars is a 10% market decline. The second grouping of pillars represents a 20% market decline. And the third grouping of pillars represents a 30% market decline. And we're somewhere between the second and the third set of pillars is where we're holding right now. And if you look at the data they're presenting, the first line is the performance, again, as measured by a, a hypothetical Fama French model, which tends to tilt uh, towards small in value. But a representative grouping of U.S. businesses, you can see that if you look back one year, three years, and five years, you're way in the positive. And so what the, the key is, is staying uh, buckled in and committed. Um, we, you have to have a plan that, that takes into account these market cycles and events. Interesting. For those who buy stocks, the day the S&P is deemed a bear and you sit 12 months, this study shows that you've got an average of almost 23% growth average 12 months after it is named a bear. Very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the team for letting me present this slide because this is my most favorite data set. And uh, indulge me because this is one of those data sets that must be uh, familiar, ingrained in any equity investor. So we'll just spend a, a, a little bit longer on this slide. Look at the blue lines and ignore the yellow. And we'll analyze what we're looking at. The blue lines represent the cumulative returns for the S&P 500 for every calendar year going back to 1980. And if you were to draw an average line across those blue lines, you'd land up with about 11%. And that's the annualized average return for the S&P 500 for each year going back to 1980. And now we introduce the yellow lines. The yellow lines are what's technically referred to as the intra-year decline. It is the decline from peak to trough for the worst second of each trading year in each given year. And you'll see there that the data is actually frightening. 
Uh, it is the price we pay to be equity investors. So if you see there in 2000 and uh, it, uh, sorry, 1980, it's a little small on your slide. So I'll, I, I will read you the data and you'll accept it to be true. I'm happy to send it to you afterwards. In 1980, the S&P 500 delivered 26% returns from January to December. But there was a moment in time when the portfolio was down 17%. And in virtually every year, there is a momentary cataclysmic statistic to cite. And yet, on average, the portfolio, as measured by the S&P 500, has delivered remarkably consistent and good results over time, averaging, as I said, right below 11%. And the average decline is 14% for the moment in each year, while the average growth for the full year is about almost 11%. And the willingness to endure that 14% decline for a moment is the price we pay for the 11% annualized return. So that, that is one of those slides that we just have to study. It's enlarged in our office. I'm happy to send it to you, but it is the price and reward for volatility. That is really what you're looking at there. And uh, here's one of those great quotes from Brian Westbury, one of the gurus we really count on, but I'll read it out loud. Market volatility is the emotional price paid for the significant long-term returns um, that quality equities have generated. So um, I just wanted to, 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 to read that from Westbury and go from there, okay? And, and the price of getting out is also huge. And you'll see here that um, the, 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 this, what we're doing here is we're taking the S&P 500. And again, the S&P 500 is a good measure for studies, for statistics. It's why it was invented. It's why we're citing it here regularly. It's easily measured, easily cited. Uh, and, and it's good sort of uh, for those purposes. The S&P 500, um, if you had been fully invested for a 20-year period ending last year, that $100,000 over that 20-year period would have grown into $616,000. But if you miss just the best, and I'll, I'll move from the right forward, the best 25 trading days, your 100,000 would have grown to 134. And what we're saying here, what we're demonstrating here, is that the total growth virtually, slight exaggeration, but almost the entire growth was experienced in just 25 trading days over a period of 20 years. And it's days like today, when the Dow is up 640 points, that you just can't afford to miss. That's the key. You have to be invested in order to participate in those upward trending spurts. Uh, over 20 years, almost the entire growth happened in just 25 trading days. And, uh, and here's another great statistic. Uh, um, what we've got here is the average annual returns during rising rates of, inflate, uh, of interest, uh, during rising interest rates periods. Because the, the two kind of fears that are driving, and Jesse really touched upon them earlier, was uh, inflation and interest rates. Uh, which are sort of compounding into uh, market sentiment, which is scaring people, market participants. And what we've got here is uh, the the performance. That it, what we're showing here is that each of these categories of stocks have done very, very well during periods of rising interest rates. And rising interest rates are, are not something that we necessarily uh, need to, to fear. It's part of normal market, uh, market processes, and uh, it'll work its way through. One of those other great, great slides and data points, data sets that we like to uh, review regularly. This is the story of Mr. Misfortune. Mr. Misfortune put $10,000 into the market at the peak before the 08 collapse. And shortly thereafter, his $10,000 turned into $5,000. And then the story diverges. This is choose your own adventure. In one story, Mr. Misfortune sells, he's had enough. He doesn't want to look at this thing anymore. He calls up his broker and says, get out. And today, Mr. Misfortune still sitting on five grand. And Mr. Resilient says, you know what? I know how this story ends. I've been through this many, many, many times before. I'm going to stay invested. I've got good advisors. We're going to see this through. And that 10000 today is worth more than $40,000 in spite of so many countless, countless calamities that the world has gone through since 2007. 
Uh, in fact, uh, when we were preparing for this presentation, it was pointed out that you could hardly read the descriptions of all of the problems because there are just so many of them. And that's really design by design. There are so many problems that we um, that we will get through. We have been through and we will get through. Bull versus bears. Bears are a natural part of the market cycle and system. And if I ask my artist friends, people with good graphic design skills to estimate the ratio of blue to orange on this slide, I'm usually told that there's approximately 90% blue and about 10% orange on this presentation. And we again won't have these over uh, uh, blown up in our office. Happy to send this data to you after the call. It's again, one of those highly informative calls. Um, Go, go back one slide, I think it is. Sorry, there you go. Okay, so we've got here is bull markets and bear markets uh, stacked since uh, 1942. And you'll see in the call out box in the top left, which may be difficult to see on the screen, the average bull market lasts four and a half years, producing 154% growth. And the price to pay is the willingness to endure 11 months of pain where we give up 32%. And um, before we move on, I want to sort of highlight a couple of other things on this slide. They call them bulls because bulls tend to kill in an upward trajectory and bears strike down. That's the folklore. Now you know. Um, I, I'm, I, I've not seen this in action, but that's what I've studied. That's what I've been told. Um, the other very, very interesting thing here you know, on a serious note is the gray vertical bars. The gray vertical bars represent recessions, and you'll see that they sometimes correlate. For example, in 2019, they correlated. No, wait, there was a correlation in 2000. In 2000, there was a correlation. But if you look back and uh, after the first, after the Second World War, there's a, a recessionary period that does not correlate. There's a period in the mid 50s that does not correlate. Again, in the early 60s, that does not correlate. In the late 70s, that does not correlate. And also in the around 1990, there was a recession in the face of uh, of strong U.S. equity markets. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is this disjointment, this dislocation, the difference between markets. And uh, and economies, and uh, we can we can have strong markets in the face of recessionary times. Um, I think that's one of the takeaways from this slide. And um, one more thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Stefan. And this is that we're actually buying businesses. And if you see yourself in the business of co-investing with great managers in strong businesses. Then what you then are able to do is look at the profits of the underlying businesses in which we're investing. And you'll see here that what we're plotting here is the S&P 500 earnings versus the index itself. And there are certainly moments, and I'm using that term loosely, but there are periods of dislocation, but there's generally extremely high correlation between the earnings of the businesses we buy and the value of those business and, and measure technically it's a correlation of 0 0.97 a one-to-one -one would be perfect correlation so it's not quite you could see those differences but generally what we're buying is what we're investing in is great businesses with strong earnings and therefore over time the price will come to reflect that and with that i'm going to ask stefan to join me to take us through the next series of slides thank you stefan Great, thank you, John. And as John covered, and as Jesse covered, a lot of the themes that were um, really covered in the previous slides were the key investment philosophies, as well as looking at the data that really drives investment decisions. And if you're looking at the, the slide that's coming up now, this is again, looking at what are the facts now? So this is looking at all the actual earnings from all the companies that are in the S&P 500 from 2012. As you could see, this is an upward trajectory. And of course, we don't have the full data yet for 2022, as well as uh, for next year, 2023. But this is an important part that Jonathan had covered in that with the correlation being so high between what the companies actually earn or the profits of a company, which is what we see here with the stock price. Again, that's what really drives a stock price. And that's why here at RVW, we're able to you know, sleep comfortably at night given that in the long run, earnings will go up. And of course, uh, with this type of data that we see, 
as, as long as earnings go up, then the stock price will also be on the upward trajectory. And looking at the next slide here, what we're seeing is uh, some of the, the figures between the actual quarterly operating earnings to sales and also looking at where the recessions lie and so forth. So this is the actual profit margins. Uh, one of the things that really uh, resonate with us is looking at it from the early 90s. So this chart starts from 90 to 1992. The actual profit margins were much smaller relative to where we are at now. And so in the 90, in 92, the operating profit margins were around 4%. Now we've really exceeded 10% plus. One of the things that was covered earlier from, I believe, Jonathan was that the technology is what really drives some of the economic factors and making everything more efficient. And this really ties in with some of the earnings slides as well as how the stock prices are correlated. As long as the profit margins are healthy, which is what we're still seeing now, this does have the data um, in terms of what we were seeing in the first quarter of 2022, the profit margins are actually still very healthy. And so that's one of the key points here in that the as long as the companies are again making profits, it will correlate with the increasing stock prices. And here what we're seeing in the next slide is looking at some of the factors that we rely on. As you can see here, uh, there are various different metrics from dividend growers all the way to dividend cutters. So that's the two uh, extremes on this data point. So if you're looking at the top line here, the dividend growers and initiators. So as long as you're either growing dividends, so it could be a company like Apple and you're growing it steadily, let's say once per year, where you initiate a div dividend. So your uh, company's having all these profits and so they're trying to initiate a dividend payment. Then in the long run from 1973 to last year, the returns have been in excess of 10%. Now, of course, look at the, looking at the other spectrum, if you're cutting dividends, a completely eliminating dividends, of course, to investors, that's a red flag. That's a red flag for us as we're evaluating all the different factors that we're, we're looking at that would outperform over time. Then you're actually seeing negative returns since 1973 to last year. So it's a big difference. And then all the other areas where you're just paying dividends or you're not paying dividends and so forth, they all fall in between. But this is why we're relying on dividend as one of the important factors that we're, we're evaluating and making sure it's that it's within the portfolios that we're evaluating. And here we're looking at the different aspects of, of expected returns. So we cover dividends. Now here we're looking at three distinct areas. So the, the first row is company size. The second row is relative price. So this is where we're looking at either value oriented stocks, stocks that may appear to be cheap on certain valuation metrics, all the way to growth stocks, which may uh, seem uh, expensive. And then of course we have here last at profitability. And we'll just take a look at US stocks because the rest of the two columns are looking at international areas, but it's all a similar story. So looking at the first row here, company size and for US stocks only, smaller companies since 1928 have outperformed larger companies by about 2%. So while that may seem small right now, you know, if you're, if you're annual, annualizing that and compounding those returns over time, that makes a, a sizable difference. And then we're seeing this now with relative pricing. So if you're looking at certain metrics that say value companies are, are very cheap and you've only invested in those type of companies, for the year, we're actually about even. We really haven't seen too much to the downside. Whereas if you're looking at pure growth companies, and just to throw out some names out there, something like a Netflix, um, and those will be the type of companies that will be pure growth. They're done actually about 30% plus for the year. And so this is where we're trying to evaluate what are some of the factors, of course, looking at value-oriented stocks that may, that may mean these companies pay dividends. These are some of the factors that we're evaluating. And last on this row is profitability. Any company that is, is generating profits tends to outperform companies that are not generating profits, which intuitively makes sense, but we actually haven't seen that uh, for, to be that case for a few years now or several years. But here, looking at the data set since 1964, profitable companies have outperformed um, low profitable companies by about 3.5% on an annualized basis. So these are 
three of the important factors that we rely on as we construct the portfolio. And then here we're looking at out of the different managers that are out there there are that are constantly choosing which stocks to buy which stocks to sell and so forth you know some of the strategies have been very popular you know you may know some of these names and of course if you're looking at the various different size of companies whether it's large cap and small cap uh, if you're looking in an on, on one year basis if you're comparing against to a large cap manager um, a lot of the actively trading managers are underperforming the index by 58%. That's what the one-year column represents. Take it all the way to the right side of the column at the 20-year mark, 93.8% of the active managers are underperforming the index. And you know this is no, no surprise because a lot of the actively uh, trading managers that are out there this year are down massively, down 50%, 60% is some of the data points that we're seeing. And again, we relied on some of the factors like profitability as a way of example, where we're using rules based approach to make sure that the portfolios are constructed in a thoughtful way now and also into the future. And so this is an important slide to really understand. And now we're looking at, you know, what are some of the largest companies uh, since 1980? And, and what you might notice here is every company is different. Uh, in the decades that you see, 1980, IBM was at the top. In 2000, we see Microsoft. And in 2020, we're seeing Apple. And so because the companies are dynamically changing at, at any given point, certain companies may outperform or underperform dramatically. And one of the things to cover here is, you know, oil in 1980 was one of the biggest companies. It's now really technology companies that are driving um, the largest companies again in 2020. Again, it's very tough, difficult to figure out which companies will outperform. So here at RVW, we're really just focusing on the data. And again, if you're looking at certain factors like balance sheets and revenue growth, these are the actual rules-based methodologies that we're relying on to make sure we own the best companies at any given point. And as we go to the next slide, uh, and one more slide from here, we're covering some of the ways to really have income in, in a sustainable way. And you may have seen that we're covering the real estate side of the things. And if you're looking at some of the macroeconomic factors, as we see on this chart here, we did not build enough homes and that continues to be the case. And so if you're looking at the, the bottom side of the chart here, what we saw in the early 1970s is that there were roughly about 210 million people. We're pushing close to 400 million now. And at that point in time, we're we are continuously building houses, more than 2 million houses per year in the early 1970s. And last year, there were actually less than 1.3 million houses completed. So with population just basically increased by 50% since 1970s, we're actually completing less houses than 50 years ago. So if you're looking at simple economics one-on-one, -on -one, supply and demand dynamic, demand is higher, supply is lower, and that's some of the background that's really driving real estate prices. And so another factor that's been talked about continuously with a lot of our conversation is that if we're looking at, let's say, comparing to 2008, a lot of what we saw was, was subprime mortgages. You know, that's not what we're necessarily seeing today. We are seeing that the, the loan requirements for the housing was very, very strong. So you have to be uh, qualified in order to get the loans. And so if we're comparing against 2008, you know, again, it, it seems to be a different environment. And if we're looking at purely the supply demand dynamic, um, it looks to be a very different scenario. And as we're looking at the next slide here, uh, we're seeing that with housing completions, as we've just mentioned, that it's much less now than pre-global financial crisis or in the 1970s, as we have discussed. And so how do we derive continuous sustainable income for clients that need that income uh, to make sure that you know that's been covered for lifestyle needs and so forth let's say in retirement and things like that historical multifamily occupancy is one of the the good data points to review as you could see remarkably uh, steady in terms of occupancy levels so we're seeing in 1999 95% as of last quarter we were at 97% but as, as you could see on this right-hand chart, chart here, it does not deviate too much. We're looking at really from 
90% to actually at its highest about 97%. And that's not surprising, right? Again, because of the shortage within the, the supply, that's why the occupancy rate is, is so high. And if you're looking at it from an income perspective, you want to be in the multifamily space. And on the next slide, what we're going to cover is, of course, it's not just multifamily, but industrial side is another area where we're seeing a lot of tailwinds. So one of the, the, the statistics that we reviewed it before, including this for our, our clients that really need income is within the industrial space, if you're look, looking at some of the revenue metrics, like uh, for industrial companies that are in the warehouses or, or distribution centers, if that's of a need, that was generating about $80 billion a quarter uh, as of 2012. So fast forward about 10 years, that's really surpassed about $200 billion from $80 billion uh, about 10 years ago. So of course, there is a huge need for industrial properties. Again, think warehouses, distribution centers. It's not just Amazon, but all the other companies need this type of space. And as, as companies are demand, in demand of this space, if you're looking at it from our perspective, as, as basically landowners or, or making sure that you're getting the rental income from these type of properties, that tends to be remarkably stable. And so as, as we cover the, the different elements of looking at our investment philosophy, and as you know, Selwyn mentioned right off the bat, that we are really driven by data. And what we're looking at is if you're looking at, let's say the current macroeconomic environment, Jesse had covered that the profits are strong, unemployment rates are at historic lows. And of course, the investment themes in our philosophy, we are at the, at the heart, we are relying on diversification, we're tilting towards factors that outperform over time, um, factors like profitability, for example, that we covered. And of course, if, if income should be considered as part of your financial planning process and as an overall part of your portfolio, then we recommend looking at some of the areas like the private real estate that we had just covered. Now, thank you everyone for coming and uh, until next time, I appreciate it.